Listener Production. Hello, welcome to The Briefing. I'm Sasha Barbagat. A major current in the Atlantic Ocean seems to be slowing down, and that is seriously bad news for climate change. We'd see large-scale climate changes. Parts of the world would get a lot drier, other parts would get a lot wetter. So just how disastrous could this be? And how much would it change the weather here in Australia? That's what we're looking at in today's Deep Dive. First, though, the news headlines with Bencion Siebert. It's Monday, May 13. Good morning, Sasha. Well, it's budget week, and that means we're getting a sneak peek into the country's immediate economic future ahead of tomorrow night's announcements. The latest is that inflation looks set to fall below 3% by the end of the year, and that's within the Reserve Bank of Australia's target range. Primary focus of the budget is that cost of living pressure, trying to ease it where we can. Uh, but we're also conscious that the, the economy is not especially strong right now. Uh, and so there are some fine balances to strike. There are in every budget. That was Treasurer Jim Chalmers on Nine there. So what does all that mean for us? Well, inflation is the rate at which the price of things in an average household budget rises. So lower inflation means the cost of living rises slower. It'll also reduce pressure on the Reserve Bank to increase interest rates, which will be a relief for people with a mortgage. It's also worth noting that these predictions from the federal government and the treasurer are rosier than what the Reserve Bank has predicted. The RBA has said that it doesn't expect inflation to come down into its target range till the end of next year, but those forecasts don't consider what's coming in this week's budget. Yeah, and lower inflation uh, is a good thing, but it is a problem for governments because Doing something about inflation means spending less and slowing the economy down and then potentially increasing unemployment. And there are forecasts that unemployment is expected to grow to 4.5% in the coming months. So it's a tightrope walk, Bencion, but uh, lower inflation, I think, will be music to a lot of people's ears when it comes to simply how much money they're having to spend for everything at the moment. Over in the US, the Biden administration is becoming increasingly critical of Israel's actions in Gaza, with Secretary of State Antony Blinken saying Israel is testing the boundaries of international law. We've heard from another poly as well, Connecticut Democrat Chris Murphy, who's a member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and he had this to say while in an interview on CNN's State of the Union. We cannot have a military invasion of Rafah that ends up in tens of thousands of additional civilians dying. That would be bad for Israel from a moral and a strategic standpoint. He went on to say that a continued war in Gaza would provide, quote, permanent recruiting material to Hamas. It comes after US President Joe Biden paused the supply of certain weapons to Israel because of its invasion of Gaza's southern city of Rafah, where some 1.4 million Palestinians are currently sheltering. Yeah, and this is a really significant moment in the relationship between Israel and the US. The US is Israel's most important ally and supplies a lot of weapons. But this seems to be a red line for US President Joe Biden if Israel decides to do a major ground invasion of Rafah, then that could be the one moment where Joe Biden is finally saying the US will not continue supplying weapons for this kind of warfare. You might remember a month or two back, we covered the story about a man receiving a pig kidney transplant in the US. Well, in a sad update this morning, the 62-year-old Richard Slayman has passed away, but doctors say there's no evidence it was because of the transplant. He had successful surgery in March and his doctors confirmed at the time he no longer needed dialysis after the new organ was said to be functioning well. Now, in addition to kidney disease, Slayman also suffered from type 2 diabetes and hypertension. Slayman's relatives say his story is an inspiration and he wanted to provide hope for thousands of people who need a transplant to survive. And if you're like me, your social media feed was packed with images of the Aurora Australis over the weekend. Skies right across Australia lit up with the rare phenomenon with reported sightings in Queensland and even in WA. Now, that is super rare because it's usually contained to, you know, around the south of the country uh, and down towards Antarctica. 
But if you live in Sydney, like I do, the cloudy wet conditions meant we did not get to see it. Now, this was caused by a monster sunspot cluster, 16 times the size of Earth, which spewed solar eruptions in our direction in the biggest geomagnetic storm in almost two decades. Uh, Bencion, before we hit record, I asked you if you had seen it. You told me you were too busy clubbing. Um, But... (laughs) Sorry, Mum. Producer, <laughs> our producer, Simon, who's on the other side of the glass, he was in Perth. You saw it, Simon? I did. And I was uh, like north of Perth City and I was looking south, so through the, the lights of the city and I could still see it and it looked like a sunset but well past the time of a sunset and right in the wrong direction. It was quite amazing. It went for about 20 minutes, that little round. <sighs> I'm really jealous. So... We know where Bencion's priorities are, which is which is clubbing and having fun. <laughs> Mine is natural phenomena. So apparently last night people were still able to see it. Uh, I was fast asleep because the best time to view this phenomenon is between 10pm and 2am and Yes, I get up at 3.15, so there was no way I was staying up to watch it. But for anyone who did see it, I'm very, very happy for you, but I'm very, very jealous. It is an extremely rare event, so I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, Bencion and Simon, thanks so much for being here for the headlines. Next up, it's our deep dive into ocean currents in the Atlantic Ocean and how they could affect climate change. Hi, Simon Beaton with you for this episode of The Briefing. Have you seen the movie The Day After Tomorrow? It's one of those ones where the world is ending. Tornadoes rage across LA, New York City freezes over, and there's these three enormous superstorms that cover Canada, Europe and Siberia that can be viewed from space, they're so large. In the film, the reason why climate change is escalating to such a level is because the main current that moves across the Atlantic Ocean stops. And this current is real. It moves heat, carbon and nutrients from the tropics, which is then cooled and sinks once it reaches the Arctic. And it really does help regulate climate on Earth. Unfortunately, it actually is slowing. Now look, if it stopped, the effects definitely wouldn't be as fast as in the day after tomorrow. Some Hollywood creative license to play there. But it really would change the climate around the world. We've recently seen the end of a hot, dry El Nino weather pattern, which came after three back-to-back wet La Ninas. And there's a strong chance that we could see another La Nina next season too, a frequency and a sequence that's never been recorded ever before. So are these two weather systems linked? Could this be a sign that things might be changing faster than expected? Joining me to help answer those questions is Professor Matthew England from the University of New South Wales. Professor England, what would happen if the Atlantic current stopped? The Atlantic current is this big overturning circulation. Um, What I mean by that is there's waters that sink around Greenland in the North Atlantic. That water that sinks is replaced by water in the tropics that's a lot warmer. And there's this engine of overturning that brings warmth to sort of the latitudes of Europe and then, you know, recycles this heat globally. So if we lost this ocean circulation, if it was to shut down altogether, it would reset the way energy moves around the world. We'd lose a lot of this heat transport north towards Europe. It would disrupt things like the jet stream in the Northern Hemisphere. We'd see um, large-scale climate changes. Parts of the world would get a lot drier. Other parts would get a lot wetter. And at the moment, we know that it is slowing. When is it predicted that it will actually stop? Yeah, it's really uncertain how close we are to this tipping point. We know with virtual certainty there is a tipping point past which it will collapse. What that refers to is that the way that the circulation works is that it will be in this so-called on state with the ocean overturning these waters. But if you freshen the surface waters, which makes them more buoyant and they don't sink, if you cross a certain uh, threshold of freshening the surface ocean in the North Atlantic, you'll shut that down. And it'll stay shut down even when that freshening anomaly has stopped, which is why we call it a tipping point. It'll go into a new state with this sort of so-called off circulation. How close we are to that tipping point is highly uncertain. Some scientists have done very defendable studies that suggest we're very close or perhaps even midway through passing that tipping point now. Other studies suggest it could be as many as, you know, hundreds of years away. And 
if that has happened, over what time scale will these changes take place? Will it be very rapid or will it take hundreds of years to see those changes in the climate where places get colder and wetter and places get drier and hotter? Yeah, some of it's very rapid. Um, if you if you get the overturning circulation collapsing, you know, in the next decade, for example, almost straight away you rearrange that energy budget I spoke about. And so those rainfall shifts, for example, the atmospheric changes like the rainfall shifts in, in location would happen virtually straight away. Um, so there would be disruption of the climate system synchronous with that shutdown. Other things take a, a bit longer to play out. So deep ocean temperatures would change but that takes sort of centuries to kick in. But there's no comfort that that longer time scale change for the deep ocean shouldn't give us cause for comfort because these other changes would be pr- pretty much synchronous with the slowing down of the circulation. What would it mean for Australia? What would happen here? Yeah, so Australia is a long way away from the North Atlantic, but because it's a global engine of ocean overturning at play, we would be impacted here um, in Australia, the Southern Hemisphere as well. And so Australia's top end, the northern parts of Australia would generally be wetter. Um, we'd have more monsoon rains uh, and, and the, the temperatures around the north of Australia would be a lot warmer in the ocean. Um, and the reason this happens is that the atmosphere gets reorganised and the trade winds that blow along the Pacific Ocean get stronger. We know this from past climate states when the Atlantic overturning has slowed down. We see these trade winds accelerate. And also we can go into model simulations and we can simulate a collapse and we can see that these winds accelerate, pushing more warm water. And Australians would be familiar with La Nina-like climate. That's exactly what you get when you collapse the overturning. You get a more La Nina-like Pacific Ocean. So you could almost get a semi-permanent shift towards La Nina conditions. So how would the stopping of the Atlantic current impact the habitability of parts of Australia? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I think you know, the, the main thing that the overturning circulation slowdown would do would be to make the top end a lot wetter. We already get big monsoon rains there during summer. They can be, uh, you know, we can get flooding rains we saw off the Queensland coast during El Nino. So warmer oceans uh, north of Australia aren't good news. Um, they just basically stack the odds higher of these flooding rain events down the Queensland coast, even down to New South Wales. Um, we know from past La Nina events that they can cause really destructive floods. So um, not every catchment every year would be flooded, but we're just rolling, you know, we're skewing the dice towards these flooding rain events um, with a shutdown of the overturning circulation and with more of that warm water sitting north of Australia. I should also say, in terms of habitability, things like vector-borne diseases, malaria transmission, you know, it needs warm, moist air for that transmission to take place. We know that malaria is going to be a threat for Australia at the top end in the future as climate changes. Having the waters w- even warmer than average north of Australia, driven by a collapse of the overturning circulation, would be disastrous for Australia because that extra warmth, as I said, skews the odds for flooding rains, but it also makes the transmission of tropical diseases, dengue fever, malaria, more likely. We've just seen the end of El Nino for this year. And before that, we had three La Ninas in a row. And it's also looking likely that we could go into another La Nina now. Tell me more about how these weather patterns interact with the Atlantic Ocean Current. Yeah, so it's a good point to raise because there is some concern amongst scientists that we're already seeing some of these impacts with a slowdown. Um, All the evidence we have is that the Atlantic overturning slowed down by maybe 10 15%. There's definitely more heat in the tropical Atlantic. The trade winds in the Pacific uh, have been strengthened over the last three or four decades. And even this El Nino we just had last summer, the waters north of Australia weren't cooler than average. That's normal El Nino conditions to have cooler ocean temperatures there. The fact they remain warmer could be indeed because of these stronger trade winds. So it is a concern. The linkages between these ocean basins um, from the Atlantic to the Pacific have only been really discovered in the last 10, 15 years. We weren't aware as much that those three basins, the Indian, the Pacific and Atlantic, kind of communicate with each other across those land masses. And so these interbasin uh, teleconnections, we call them, are, are very strong. And an Atlantic slowdown would lead to a, an ocean north of Australia that's warmer than average. Uh, we're seeing that at the moment. 
That could also just be pure climate change kicking in. But a link to the Atlantic is entirely plausible because we do know that the trade winds have increased and that's linked in turn to this um, warmer Atlantic ocean temperatures. Could it be an indication that the Atlantic Ocean current is changing faster than anticipated? Yeah, it could be an indication. It's certainly consistent with that slowdown I mentioned. The fact that we've measured the overturning circulation has slowed down over the last 100 years. It bumps around from decade to decade, but it's been an overall slowing trend. And the amount of slowdown we see there is consistent with the amount that the Pacific trade winds have accelerated, which is consistent with the warming north of Australia. So the pieces of the puzzle are all there. They sit together and fit with this overturning circulation being in a slowdown phase. So the conditions we're experiencing already now in Australia could be um, having some influence from the Atlantic. All right. So none of that's good. Let's assume that it is as well. Is there any way that we can stop it from happening? Yeah, it, it's a great question to, to think about. And, and so we can stop it from happening. The, the key thing that is driving that slowdown in the North Atlantic is both warming from greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, warming the system, but also freshening of the ocean up there. I mentioned earlier that fresh water is very buoyant and the fresh water that's streaming off the Greenland ice sheet in huge quantities today is making the oceans up there less salty and less salty water doesn't sink as easily and they act to slow the circulation down. So the one way to give us a chance of not having that tipping point crossed is to move away from fossil fuels to reduce our emissions. And we need to do as quickly as possible because when we burn fossil fuels, that carbon dioxide sits in the atmosphere and it stays there radiating heat back to earth it's not like we'll see those greenhouse gases decline for you know immediately. They really, we need to stop the emissions to stabilise the climate and then hope that we haven't passed those tipping points already. Wow. There's uh, a lot of variables there. Let's hope it's not too bad. Uh, Professor Matthew England, thank you so much for coming on the briefing. Thanks, Simon. Great to be here. And that is all that we have time for today. Thank you so much for joining us. If you did find that chat interesting, please do share it around with a friend or family member and make sure you hit follow so you never miss anything from us. My name is Simon Beaton. See you next time.